Thank you for tuning in to another episode of One More Story. Just a quick programming note, parents, if you would like to skip past the interview and go straight to the first story, you can find it at the 6 minute 40 second mark. Also, we recorded the episode prior to the writer's strike, so any of Kyle's plans to pitch or sell written material have been scuttled until wealthy CEOs come to their senses and decide to pay writers a living wage. And please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review and follow us on all the social media platforms at One More Story Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in and enjoy tonight's episode. Kyle Bornheimer, welcome to One More Story. Thank you for coming on, man. How are you? Happy to be here. I'm I'm excellent. Thank you so much. Kyle is an accomplished actor and writer. What are you What are you up to these days? Um, I'm waiting to hear back on a couple of season twos. Hopefully, I've got a show on Amazon Freebie called High School that I really love. It's uh, set in the '90s in the indie music world. It's based on Tegan and Sarah. Oh, nice their real life yeah in the book they wrote and i i love it we're hoping to, to go back for a season two here soon yeah and so just sort of developing projects and fingers crossed on a project that could be gone pretty soon uh, uh with a colleague of mine with a co-worker uh, co-writer of mine and uh yeah just plugging away well cool man well so so since this is a story time podcast for kids obviously we need to keep things g-rated but we can still have a little fun. But some of my questions have to do with your bedtime routine. I'm curious, how uh, how do you wind down after a busy day? Winding down would be wonderful. We more, I would use terms like high strung, hitting a wall, <laughs> lots of slammed doors, lots of reminders about tomorrow, lots of you know what's going on up there. And you're speaking about your children, yes? Yes, yes. Oh, you oh, you want to know about I mean, my... I, either, either one. This is, it all, it's all relevant. Yeah, I mean, so, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm joking a little bit about the current one. You know, my kids are 14 and 12 now. Okay. Um, 12-year-old just kind of graduated to sort of just wanting to be a little bit left alone. Uh, doesn't need the, the tuck-in as much, but... Until very recently, we had pretty solid tuck-in game at the house, a pretty solid <laughs> w- winding down game. I mean, I loved reading to them. Uh, my wife and I both love reading to them, and you know, they've kind of expected us to, for the last half hour of the night to be in their room, either reading. I know about four guitar chords, so I can you know, I serenade them sometimes, and they had no idea that I really didn't know what I was doing. They thought Dad could pl- actually play a guitar, and I was just you know, basically playing you know, uh, knocking on heaven's door. Uh, in different variations, uh, and they they know they're known the wiser. Sometimes I read Moby Dick to them at night. I mean, so everything from normal standard Doctor Seuss fare to uh, then I got on a kick of reading full novels, a ones that I wanted to read <laughs> and knew that I would never get around to it and never find the time. So I figured I got this half hour here at nine o'clock, eight thirty, to do so. And that went. I don't know if you've ever read Moby Dick, but you know, ninety percent of that novel is just him talking about whaling. But yeah, I mean, I'm lamenting it a little. I'm. I'm, I'm sad to see it go a little bit right now as they get older, but I think I can, I, I might be able to revive the reading thing for them because they still, you know, they're like any other kids, they don't love to go to bed necessarily. So if I can give an excuse to go in there, talk with them or, or, you know, we do games sometimes we'll do drafts. My son loves to do crazy drafts, like a draft for favorite candy bars or, or favorite sodas. So that, that'll sometimes put them to bed. Yeah. And, and when I was a kid, my greatest memory, I grew up in Indiana and, uh, my brother and I, slept on bunk beds and my dad would read i don't know if he read every night but i have very very vivid memories of him laying on the ground and reading to us and he had a very my dad was actually was an anchor man for about five years um that's what he went to school for was journalism yeah so he but he had a very classic mid 20th century announcer's voice and so i he had a very booming voice and a great vocabulary and was a great reader and so I just have very vivid memories. And there was one set of books, and I've looked for it since. And I don't know if you've ever heard of these, but they're very old. I mean, they were old when he was reading them. So their sensibilities, I'm sure, are very dated. But they are nostalgic for them. And they were called Uncle Arthur books. Oh, yeah. During COVID, when I was sort of eBaying everything and trying to find a bunch of nostalgia things, I did find a set of Uncle Arthur books. But they'd have little morality tales wrapped in a, in a story about kids and stuff. That's a memory I have of, of bedtime when I was a kid. My dad played a little guitar 
kind of like yourself. But he would sing to me the House of the Rising Sun. Well, and that's that's one of the ones you learn when you don't know the guitar. I well, know. <laughs> well, and then later in life, I found out what that song was about. Is it about brothels or like? It is. It is about a house of ill repute. That <laughs> was the original title. Yeah. <laughs> but he, it's a it's a haunting tune. It really, I it kind of gave me nightmares. I, I gotta say, I think it's a it's a wonderful song, but it is it is haunting. No, no, it's not a kid's song, and it's no, I there's like I, like I said, there's about five songs I can go to all with this about the same chords, and that's always the one that comes up when you when you Google easy guitar, <laughs> easy songs to play, and that comes up, and so that's why there's a bunch of dads, including myself, that have. Haunting generations of kids for years because that's the only one. And knock on heaven's door, I play, which is also a very depressing song. You got to wind things down. You're not going to be singing "Party in the USA" for bedtime. So, with that in mind, should we get into uh, our our session? Are we ready for mm-hmm. the first word? All right. Do you want me to start? Sure. All right. I'll start. Peanut butter. The word for our story duel is peanut butter. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who lived deep in the mountains of Appalachia. And her family, they didn't really have a lot of money, so she was often very hungry. And one of her favorite things to eat was peanut butter because it was it was relatively cheap. And so one day she was at school and her mom had packed her this peanut butter and jelly sandwich and to her that was just the the greatest sandwich ever i mean no matter rich or poor a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is just a classic she would pack it with some ruffles potato chips and a juice box and maybe an apple maybe some oreo cookies and it was really special and so one day she took her lunch to school and at break before lunch she went into her backpack because she was going to get her her snack she was going to you know maybe have her apple and she went into her backpack and the entire lunch was gone she looked in every little pocket of that backpack and even the little secret pocket that sometimes her mom would put the stuff that she would never eat like apples or actually she would always put that in there after her mom made her have all the vegetables and the fruits and it wasn't there she looked all over the cloakroom she looked all over her classroom she retraced all of her steps to see where if she might have dropped this sandwich on the way to school she even walked all the way back home and she looked in the kitchen she looked in the refrigerator she wondered did i even take it with me today she walked all through the house, all over the, the yard and, in, and around the, the perimeter of the house. She asked her neighbor, did you see me leave today? Did you see anything fall out of my, my backpack? No one had an answer for her. She had no idea where this thing went. So she had to run back to school. School was, the school bell had just rung and she just slid into, into math class or into class. It was her math teacher. That was always on Tuesdays that she always had to do math. She couldn't think about math that day at all. She couldn't think about English the next class. She couldn't think about social studies the next class. All she could think about was what was going to happen at 12 o'clock when she was so excited to eat this peanut butter and jelly sandwich and it wasn't there for her. So finally, tick, 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 the clock is at 1159 and all of a sudden it turns 12 and it's lunchtime. And it was about the saddest that she's ever been. A, she wasn't going to have a meal at all. B, she wasn't going to have the peanut butter and jelly sandwich she was going to have. And C, she didn't know if she'd ever have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich again. She never knew if her parents could could afford peanut butter again. So then she started thinking about her, her poor parents, how hard they had worked to get that peanut butter, how hard they'd worked to make the bread, how hard they worked to get jelly. Jelly's not easy to get either. And she went into lunch feeling about as down as any kid could feel. But then 
As she walked into the cafeteria, she saw something very interesting. In the corner of the cafeteria, there was a, a very dark corner of the cafeteria. She heard a low growl and she just thought at first it was her stomach, right? I mean, that would be the, the natural thought. She's, she's starving. She, she wants her peanut butter sandwich. But it was a growl, not like one she had heard before. And it didn't necessarily scare her. It more intrigued her. And so she got up and she walked towards the very dark corner of the cafeteria. And there was a little gremlin eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And she thought she didn't know what to think. I mean, she was a little frightened. This thing was scaly. It had bulgy eyes, but it was kind of cute in a way too, because it was it was smiling, obviously, because it was really enjoying this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And she didn't know, like, do I do I go tell a teacher? You know, that, I mean, the the PE teacher could probably he was a big, just a big guy. He could he could probably take the gremlin. I mean, the gremlin was small. This was a gremlin, you know, but but strong compact but it was such a surreal experience i mean the last thing you expect to see in the corner of a cafeteria is a gremlin eating your peanut butter and jelly sandwich so she turned to her friend marcia and asked her have you ever seen this before marcia said not me but then all of a sudden from another corner we heard Psst, hey it was a kid they had never met before they figured third maybe fourth grade He'd seen her around, but didn't really know her name. They looked over, and the kid said, Peanut butter, huh? So Marsha and our little girl, who has a name or no name? She should have a name. Holly and Marsha went over to the little girl. Said, yeah, how'd you know? Peanut butter burglar. What? Peanut butter burglar got your peanut butter jelly sandwich. Never seen him before? No. Yeah. He's been haunting these halls for about five years. My first run in was about two years ago when I was about your age. Bought a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at school. By the time lunch came, wasn't in my bag. I said, Well, what'd you do? Well, for a while, I didn't do much about it. Then I talked to some other kids who had the same experience. Well, we just came up with a plan recently. You want to be part of our peanut butter recovery club? Polly and Marsha looked at each other. This is like a cool older kid. And she liked peanut butter. And she had a plan to get peanut butter and jelly sandwich back. So they said, sure, what do we got to do? She said, well, we've already got our spy and we've already got our equipment person. We need a scout. A scout? Yeah, a scout comes to school a little bit early and checks all the hallways and all the, 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 the area around the, the school and sees if they see the, the gremlin. What if we don't see anything? That's okay. You're just the scouts. You report back, we'll give you a couple walkie-talkies, and you tell us what you see. Then we all gather in the front of the school, and our spy, she goes around, and she goes inside once everyone's here. She looks around, sees in the lockers, she looks in the, the empty classrooms, and she says where this thing is hiding. And then our equipment person comes in. And this is where it gets really interesting because she's invented a peanut butter burglar detector. These things are awesome. They beep whenever the peanut butter uh, burglar is around and we'll each get one. We go around hallway to hallway. And when that thing starts beeping, you will, you alert us right away and we come and get you. Okay. Okay. Want to start tomorrow? Yeah. All right. You guys get here right as school starts, maybe a few minutes before. You check the perimeter. You tell us if you see anything, any signs, because that'll help us go to a specific part in the school. Then we'll all gather. We'll spread out. You'll get your equipment. You'll get your peanut butter uh, burglar detector, and we'll go from there. All right? You all need code names, though. Code names? Yeah. You can come up yourself. Just have a code name by tomorrow. So the next morning... Marsha and Holly arrived at school a few minutes early as instructed and they got their walkies and they started scouting the perimeter and as they were walking they realized well gosh we don't we don't have code names so Marsha said to Holly well you're pretty tall so we're gonna call you Beanpole and uh, I love peanut butter so we're just gonna call me 
peanut butter. It wasn't the most inventive of names, but it was something and it was different and it, it gave them these super spy identities that, that they loved. They loved to have a code name. So peanut butter and bean pole made their way around the school perimeter. And when they got to the gym, they split off. And once they were out of each other's sight, they did a walkie test, everything was good. They could hear everybody and they could hear the equipment manager, I guess would be the name, the equipment manager, who not only had devised these detective or these detector devices, he had a, a trap that he had been working on. It wasn't fully tested out, but if they caught the peanut butter burglar today, they would break this thing in and hope for the best. So the two girls split off and Holly ended up in the girls' locker room. And it was early, right? The school hadn't really started. And she heard she heard the shower running. And and she she thought that that was curious. And so she walked very carefully, very slowly. The walkie went off and she immediately silenced it. She didn't want to give away her position because she was super spy, super scout, peanut butter, and she, she knew better. But then the water turned off and Holly froze. And out of the shower emerged two members of the janitorial staff who were in there just checking the showers and cleaning. Whew. Holly was relieved that she didn't have to confront any sort of peanut butter burglar, but just then, beep, 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 her alarm went off again. Her equipment went off again, and she startled. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Fourth grade hallway, fourth grade hallway. So she runs past the, the janitorial staff. She runs out the door. She sees Ma, uh, she sees Marcia coming around the corner. She said, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Yeah, I, I see, I heard it, I heard it. They all go up. They go up to the fourth grade uh, hallway. The other two, the leader of the group and the equipment manager all converge at the same time. There's four of them now going right to the end of the hallway, which is now lit up and bright. And at the very end, the trap has been activated. It was a two series of nets, one net that would come down uh, on one side of, of whoever was trapped and another net on the other side. And then it would automatically, if you got there quick enough and you tied it to, to a part on the wall, there was no way that whoever got trapped there could get out. And sure enough, there was the peanut butter burglar chomping on some poor kid's peanut butter sandwich that he'd gotten to earlier. There was a name on the bag. It said Little Polly. And you know, they know Little Polly. She's a kindergartner. And she knows that she loves her peanut butter and banana sandwiches. They saw a little piece of banana going through. She, they knew who he took it from. And he had just taken one bite of it. They said, stop. And he looked over and he was very, very scared. And he just sort of froze. And as they walked, they said, that's not your sandwich. And as they got closer and closer, they saw a little teardrop going from the gremlin's eye. They all looked at each other. They decided they didn't want to be mad at this gremlin, but they did want to, uh, uh, this gremlin to understand that he can't take other people's sandwiches. But they said, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And he said, I know what I did was wrong. I know that I shouldn't take other people's peanut butter sandwiches, whether it's peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and bananas, peanut butter and carrots. Carrots? Oh yeah, there's a kid that eats peanut butter and carrots. Really? Oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. It's Josh. He's in third grade. He loves peanut butter and carrots. He actually puts carrots on everything. He has carrots in his milkshakes. Really? People put anything with peanut butters because peanut butter is really the kind of thing you can put with anything. And he said, but you see, when I was an itty bitty gremlin, I never got to have any treats. I never got to have marshmallows. I never got to have chocolate. I never got to have a nougat. I don't even know what nougat is. At which Holly said, I don't think anyone knows what nougat is. They all kind of chuckled a little bit, including the gremlin. It was the first time they'd seen him laugh since they got there. They said, well, why didn't you ever get to have any treats? He said, because we're gremlins. We never had any money. We don't have any clothes and we don't have any pockets to put any money. So we could never buy peanut butter. We've always had to steal it. And the kids huddled together and they whispered and then they broke from the huddle as a united front. And they told that little peanut butter burglar gremlin man thing. You know what? Peanut butter burglar gremlin man thing. That's not right. And we're sorry that 
you grew up with no pockets and no clothes and no money, but you can't steal. And so what we're going to do is we're going to keep bringing our peanut butter deliciousness to school every day. But from this day on, we're going to bring an extra sandwich just for you because you're really not so bad. And that's what they did. And he became part of their friend group from then on and went on to high school and he was in a few weddings and it was a really nice relationship that lasted through the years all because they shared their peanut butter sandwiches. All right, nicely done. Let's just dive right into the next one. The word prompt for the solo story is four-leaf clover. All right, settle in. You can close your eyes if you want and keep them open if you want. I want to tell you a story, and this story is centered around a four-leaf clover. Now, I don't know if you know about four-leaf clovers, a little leaf that you can find around. I think they're pretty much around the world, but they're really known and associated with the country of Ireland. And one of the, I guess you could say, the myths, the magic, the story about a four-leaf clover is that it gives you good luck. And this is a story that's a little bit about luck, a little bit about magic, and how a four-leaf clover really helped a little boy named Carl. So, Carl lived in Ireland, and I've only been to Ireland once, but I can tell you, Ireland is green. Ireland's hills are green. Ireland's trees are green. I think even Ireland's water is green. Like a good green, not like a yucky green, but like a really cool Irish green. You could walk for miles and miles and miles and still be in awe of all the different shades of green in Ireland at the rolling hills. And that was Carl's favorite thing to do, was to walk the rolling hills. He'd find a stick and he would just walk and walk and walk. He lived on a beautiful farm. They had lots of sheep and lots of other animals. And his favorite thing to do was just to explore the area around it. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to just leave your house in the morning into a big backyard and just explore all day, but that's what Carl got to do. He had a pretty fun childhood. He got to explore the woods around his house. He got to explore the mountains and the hills around his house with his brothers and sisters, with his friends, with his mom and dad. They'd all just have adventures. Anything that his imagination could conjure up, he could do in those big rolling green hills behind his house. But well, one day, he noticed that his mom and dad were at the kitchen table. They were talking and they were a little bit sadder than usual. And he found out from his brother and sister that his mom and dad both had to find new jobs because the factory in town had shut down. And they were a little bit worried that they weren't gonna find a new, a new job. And his brother and sister says, they're gonna be fine, but we gotta help out around the house a little bit more. I'm gonna do a little more of the dishes. I'm gonna clean the windows. And Carl said, well, what can I do? How can I help out? They said, you got to find a four-leaf clover. Four-leaf clover? It's like, yeah, mom and dad are really hard workers. And we're a really good family. And we have a lot of love for each other. And that hard work and that love, that's pretty much going to carry us through. But we need a little bit of luck, too. So if you can find a four-leaf clover, the most special four-leaf clover that is out there, and you can give it to mom and dad, that's going to put them over the, over the hump. That's going to help them find their new jobs and help them be a little less anxious when they get home. And Carl said, that's my job then. I know these hills better than anyone. I know this forest better than anyone. I will find the perfect four-leaf clover. So that day he told his mom and dad he was going out to play in the backyard and he got permission. They said, sure, just be safe. Take one of your brothers or sisters with you. And he said, okay. He picked his sister, Alice, because she's a really good adventurer too said, you want to come go find a perfect four-leaf clover for mom and dad to help them with their job search? And she, they said, of course, of course. She's like, I know the perfect place to look first. And it was a creek just on the edge of the little thicket. Thicket's kind of like a little forest that isn't as big as a forest, but still like, kind of looks like one. They said, well, go to the creek. And at the creek, if you really follow it down, 
There's a bunch of frogs down there. They're my favorite. I even named them Freddy the Frog, Frankie the Frog, Flannel the Frog. It's a bunch of F's names. You know, it's it's a pretty easy thing to do to name a frog. You just think of another F name. So you can name some dog frogs and they go there too. And if you watch them hop around, they go to the most beautiful little patch of four-leaf clovers and i know that we're gonna find it there so they set out had a backpack they had a little baggie that they were gonna put the four-leaf clover in and they went out and they they went to the creek and when they got to the creek they found the frogs and these frogs these frogs were fun they hop all over the place they make funny faces and sure enough they hopped over all over these rocks to this patch but when they got to the patch there are no four-leaf clovers left i said i Sure, there was a bunch here. She looked at the frog, and there was one frog that was sort of raising its eyes like she wanted the kids to bend down and talk to it. Is this frog trying to tell us something? They bent down, Alice and Carl, and the frog said, Ribbit, no clovers. What? Did he just say no clovers? I think he said ribbit. I think he said ribbit and no clovers. Ribbit, all gone. Now they were sure that this little frog was talking to them. But then the frog did a little head nod, like one of those head nods that says, come this way. It was kind of hard for a frog because frogs don't really have necks. So it took a little bit of time for the frog to realize how he could actually communicate to these humans until he just said, Ribbit, come here. Should have thought of that earlier. So they followed the frog. They followed the frog past the creek over this beautiful hill, over a beautiful glen. Don't ask me what a glen is. It's something out in nature, and I've never really known what a glen is. But I like that word, and I'm pretty sure Ireland has glens. You can look that up or ask your mom and dad. They go over a glen, they walk upon this bridge, and under the bridge is a troll. I don't know if you know about bridge trolls. There's lots of stories to tell about them. They're pretty much like any other person. Some are good, some are bad, some are in between. We didn't know what this troll was at first. He looked pretty friendly, but here's what was pretty darn sure. That troll had a lot of four-leaf clovers and was really enjoying them practically throwing all these four-leaf clovers over its head, wasting them. Take a four-leaf clover and pick the leaves off of it. And the kids were like, no, no, that, that could be the perfect clover for our family. So the frogs sort of gave them a look like, it's up to you now. And so Alice and Carl looked at each other and they said, as long as we stick not near each other, we can at least ask the troll a question. So they went down, peered around the corner of the bridge. And they said, hello? And the troll sort of startled just because they hadn't, didn't know that there were other people there. Oh, sorry, you startled me. Uh, hi, um, I'm Carl, and this is Alice, and um, can we just ask about all those four-leaf clovers you have? And the troll said, why? Like, well, um, you're kind of hoping to uh, to get one of them, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, why? Uh, well, it's just um, our family needs a little bit of good luck, and I don't know, it's, we just thought it'd be a nice gesture for our parents. Uh, why? Um, well, I guess just because our parents are very loving and supportive of us, and we just want to be loving and supportive of them. They're always getting us little things, no matter how much they can afford. They'll give us like a little tiny thing on our birthdays or on holidays, and we just want to give something back to them. Uh, why? And at this point, Carl and Alice figured that this troll was just going to say why all the time. I mean, they might as well just name this guy Why Troll. They were not getting anywhere with this. So they finally cut through it all and said, listen, please. If you could just give us one of these clovers, we'll be out of your way. And finally, the troll was like, Meh, and tossed them a clover. And Carl picked it up and said, thank you. Carl looked at it and he showed Alice. He said, is this special enough? Alice said, I think so. I mean, how special can a clover be? It's it's really just the gift that matters, right? The thought? Carl said, yeah. And then they turned. Carl had another thought, though. Carl didn't think it was fair for one person, one troll, or one creature to have all these four-leaf clovers. He said, excuse me, one more thing. Do you think there's a way you could return some of those to the patch so that the frogs and others can enjoy some of those four-leaf clovers? And maybe some of the seeds can, you can plant some more? The troll, of course, said, why? Which he was expecting. So he said, before you say why, I just need to tell you something. Four-leaf clovers are for everybody, and they're much more fun when you share them. If you're down here alone enjoying them without anyone else, I don't know how fun that's going to be for you. But if you return them, not only are you sharing the experience with others, but they're going to really think highly of you. They're going to think you're a pretty good guy for returning those four-leaf clovers. So it's sort of a win-win. The troll thought about it, and the troll said, fine. But I'm not really allowed to take any requests unless you answer a riddle. It's a whole thing with trolls. Used goes back millennial. You have to 
get past the bridge, you gotta answer riddle from the troll. I don't like it even much as you do, but it's just something us trolls have to do. We gotta give you a riddle, and then you gotta answer it. Well, Carl and Alice were actually pretty good with riddles. Their mom and dad love puzzles, so they were like, sure, lay it on us. So, the troll said, here's the riddle. And at that point, he froze. He hadn't had to give a riddle in a hundred years, and all his riddles were very dated. They all had to do with steam trains and hand-cranked cars. So he had to think of a modern riddle and a new riddle that no one had ever heard of in the form of a knock-knock joke. He's like, I don't remember any riddles, but I know a knock-knock joke. And he said, knock-knock. And Carl and Al said, who's there? And he said, banana. Banana who? Knock-knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock-knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? And this is when Carl and Alice knew that the troll had tricked them. This is the only knock-knock joke that goes on forever. And as most of you probably know, the only way out of this knock-knock joke is to say orange. Orange, you're glad I didn't say banana. And it didn't seem like this troll was going to say orange anytime soon. So they just decided they were going to walk away with their four-leaf clover quietly. As this troll just kept saying, eventually to no one, banana. 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 He backed away. He could even hear the troll in the background going, Banana. 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 Way as they passed that glen. Remember that glen I talked about that I have no idea what it is? They passed that glen. They went back over the creek. They explained to the frogs that they tried to get the four-leaf clovers but couldn't get them. They went all the way home. They took this four-leaf clover. They it, put it in the tiny vase and they put it on their table, on the table for their parents to see. And that night, their parents came home and they saw the four-leaf clover and they found out that Carl and Alice had given it to them and they found out that their other children had cleaned the house and made the beds and did all this sweet stuff for them and they smiled and they told their family they loved them and they said thank you so much no matter what happens this family will always go through it we'll, we'll always get through it together because we have love in our hearts and we support each other and so they all went to bed that night and in the distance, as he was going to bed, Carl could still hear that troll saying, banana, banana. He felt bad for the troll. So he thought real hard, and he said he wanted to do one last gesture for the day. He just thought real hard to the universe, and he said, I really, really, really wish that that troll realized that if he shared those four-leaf clovers, he'd be so much happier. And so he sent that thought out into the night, and it carried on the wind, and then jumped on the back of a bird, and it even jumped on the wing of a bat. And then it fell off the bat's wing, and that thought hit another gust of wind, and then a leaf that was falling from a tree, and that thought landed right on the head of the troll as he was saying banana, banana. But he touched the leaf, and he had a thought. He stopped saying banana, and he gathered up all his four-leaf clovers, put them in a satchel, and he walked from underneath the bridge, over the field, over the glen that I don't know really what a glen is, through the forest, to the creek, and he took all the four-leaf clovers out, and he put them onto that patch again where all the frogs play. And he took some of the seeds, and he planted the seeds, and he knew that once the sun came up, and once there was a little bit of rain, there'd be even more four-leaf clovers. And he looked at the work he did, and he smiled, and he looked at all the frogs who were asleep, and he smiled at them too, and then he walked back to his bridge with a big smile on his face. The end. Thank you to Kyle Bornheimer for coming on tonight and helping us tell some truly strange and funny tales about a gremlin and a troll. Hopefully the kids are fast asleep. Parents, if you're still awake, be sure to catch Kyle in high school on Amazon Freebie. Thank you and good night.